Well, the story, a true story, that was told regarding a minister who was bold enough to preach about sin, and he really didn't mince any words about sin. In fact, he would call it in his sermons that abominable thing that God hates. And uh, one day, one of the people in his congregation came up to him, and he said, you know, Pastor, he said, I really wish that you would stop talking so harshly about sin. He said, I, I wish you would quit calling it sin. I wish you would use the word error, mistake, or even a twist in our nature. I wish you would use those words in place of the word sin. That seems so harsh. The pastor went on to say, he said, I, I understand what you mean. And going to his desk, he took out a bottle. And you said, this isn't a bottle, but he said, you see this bottle? It contains the word strychnine on it. You see the red label here says poison. Would you suggest I change the label and paste one on it that says wintergreen? He said, the more harmless the name, the more dangerous the dose will be. That's a true story. Sin. We don't like to talk about it much, do we? And we certainly don't like it when someone points out our sin. Maybe some of you are like that man in the congregation. You wish that we wouldn't talk about it. Just call it an error or a mistake or a twist in our nature. But for the child of the king, what should be our attitude towards sin? Should we deny it, ignore it, justify it? Well, John gives us two attitudes towards sin in the text we're going to study this morning. And my, I say to you in love, you either have one or the other attitude. There is no way that you can have both attitudes that John will mention regarding your sin. So as I read the text, I want you to notice how many times John mentions the word sin just in these verses. We're going to look at chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 2, verse 2. And I've entitled this lesson, What is Your Attitude Towards Sin? Notice what John writes. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, in my translation, sin was mentioned seven times. In your translation, it might be mentioned up to eight times. It doesn't mean you have the wrong translation, but there are different uh, wordages. But it's le mentioned at least seven or eight times. Now, if you were here last week when we were in the second lesson, we looked at uh, the character of God in verse five, and we noticed that John doesn't just say, God is a light, like the light I'm pointing to, but we learn that God is light. God equals light. Like today, we're going to learn that God righteousness, not that God is righteous. Righteousness describes who God is. Light describes God. And then we saw the character of those walking in darkness last time. They lie and they don't practice the truth. Even though they say they're of God, they're lying. They lie and they don't practice the truth. And lastly, we ended with the character of those walking in light from verses 6, and se six to 7. They have fellowship with each other. And we saw the word fellowship is not uh, just somebody even asked me yesterday on the phone. I was discipling a gal in another state. And she says, what is fellowship anyway? And I said, well, I'm glad you asked. And uh, it's not just hanging out at a coffee shop and talking about uh, different things going on in the world. It's a partnership we have. We saw that it was related to a property that a, a married couple would jointly own. And so it's a partnership we have with Christ. And because of our partnership with Christ, we have fellowship with each other. Our common ground is Christ. And so we saw that those walking in the light, they have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them from all sin. And so the transition is really easy to see. John is still reflecting on those who walk in the light 
and those who walk in darkness. Ladies, you're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. If you're walking in the light, you have a right attitude towards sin, a proper attitude. However, if you're walking in darkness, you have an improper attitude towards sin. And so our outline is really very simple. We're going to see, uh, see a wrong attitude for those walking in darkness in verses 8 and 10. And then the right attitude that we should have towards sin in verse 9 and then chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. So let's begin looking, first of all, at a wrong attitude towards sin. Notice what John writes in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now we saw last week that John already said, noticed that if we say something and he, we talked then about these were the false teachers, the Gnostic, the heresies, and we equated Gnostic teachers to much of like what we see today in the word of faith movement. I went last week into what Gnosticism is, so if you weren't here last week, you might want to listen to the recording of what that terrible, massive heresy is. And ladies, it's in the church today. And so here we have these people People again, not only the Gnostic teachers, but also those that were sitting there in the congregation who were saying the same thing. And now they're saying, we have no sin. In fact, the Greek is they're boasting about it. We have no sin. And ladies, listen very carefully. The Greek word here in verse 8 is different than in verse 10 and what they're talking about. Right here in verse 8, they're denying the very nature of sin. I have no sin. I don't even have a sin nature. That's what they're saying. And uh, I was talking to a, one of the ladies I disciple. You guys know Maggie Roller, some of you do. And several years ago, one of the preachers here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who is in Word of Faith, a preacher, church, I could name the church and you know who he is, she was giving him a golf lesson. And uh, Maggie told me, she said, you're not going to believe this, Susan. And I said, what? She said, he actually told me he had no sin. He had no sin nature. And I said, well, what did you say? And uh, take me the rest of my lesson to tell you what she said. Because if you know Maggie Roller, boy, she, she uh, knows her Bible and she shared the gospel with him. But I said, he actually said that? She said, yeah, he did. He said he doesn't sin. He has no, no, no sin nature whatsoever. Now in verse 10, we're going to see that they're denying acts of sin, different specific acts of sin. So the false teachers were coming in and saying, I have no sin. So what does that mean? We saw last week, they can do whatever they want in their body. Remember we saw the body was, uh, it's matter, it's evil. So it didn't, you weren't responsible. So you could commit adultery, you could kill somebody, you weren't responsible for what you did in your body. And so here they're denying the whole principle of sin. I do not have a sin nature. I have no guilt. And ladies, did you notice John uses a pronoun we? If we say we have no sin, why is he doing that? John is including himself in this. John realizes something you and I should realize. And we're talking about the apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He realized that he would be in grave danger if he said, I have no sin. I have no sin nature. And so John says, if we say we have no sin, then two things are true about us. Notice what he says. First of all, he says, we deceive ourselves. And secondly, the truth is not in us. This is almost identical to what we had last week in verse 6. So if I say I have no sin, John says you've deceived yourself, which literally reads you've led yourself astray. You've led yourself astray astray. It's not a person that's deceived without being aware he's deceived, but it's one who leads himself astray. Isn't it interesting that John does not say we deceive others or we deceive God? Ladies, people know if you're a believer or not. They're, they know. I remember the night before we got married, my husband almost called off our wedding. Why? because he began to realize I probably was not a believer. I didn't deceive my husband. And after we got married, I didn't deceive him. He still realized that I, in fact, probably realized more and more because my behavior got worse and worse after marriage. Marriage didn't solve the problem. Only salvation solved the problem. So for 10 years into my marriage, I wasn't deceiving my husband. He knew it. And you know what? We can't deceive God either. Everything is naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do, Hebrew says. So God scans our heart. 
He knows even more than our husband or our children uh, or our friends. I remember after I got saved for the, for the fourth and final time, which was the real time, and I had to call my parents to tell them I was going to be baptized for the fourth time uh, and final time. And uh, I remember my mother said, Susie, I'm not surprised. I've seen the change in you. And so we don't deceive others. John says if you say you have no to sin, you don't deceive others. They see it. They see your life. You don't deceive God. He can't be deceived, right? But he's saying you're deceiving yourself. What are you deceiving yourself about? In thinking you're a Christian. The Gnostic teachers, they say, hey, I, they, I know God. I, I have this hotline to heaven. I have this special relationship with God. You guys don't have it, but I have it. <laughs> and I have no sin. And John says you've deceived yourself. You have deceived yourself. You've led yourself astray. The second thing that's true about those who say they have no sin, John says the truth is not in them. What does that mean? It means we've misled ourselves concerning the truth of the gospel. What did Jesus say? I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. So the truth isn't in you. You think it is, but it is not in you. The Gnostics were claiming this special relationship with God, a superior knowledge. They were leading those at the church of Ephesus astray. And John says, no, nope. <laughs> You can say you know him, but you're proving by your claim that you have no sin nature, that you're false, and you are not a true believer. Well, the opposite of saying we have no sin is to realize we do sin, and we confess our sins, and that, my friend, is the attitude of those walking in the light. This is the proper attitude towards sin. This is an evidence that you're walking in the light. This is an evidence that you're a genuine child of God. Remember we saw last week, the purpose statement of John is what? These things I've written unto you that you might know for sure you have eternal life. You don't have to be in doubt about it. And we said last week, there's 20 tests in 1 John. Well, here's one of them right here. Here's one of the valid tests you can know for sure. Look at verse 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So, ladies, the proper attitude towards sin is admit it. Confess it. What does it mean to confess my sins? It means to say the same thing that God says about my sin. Ladies, this is a woman who's conscious that she's done wrong, she's convicted, and she admits it. Um, for example, you know, I don't like very many interruptions in my day, but they happen often. And, uh, you know, my husband used to say, Susan, impatience possess your soul. And I know what he was saying, so be content with whatever the Lord allows. But sometimes, you know, we get those, as Elizabeth Elliot says, divine interruptions in our day. And if we're not careful, even they're ordained by a loving father, we can get irritated, right? Well, why'd that have to happen today? And uh, right now my car is in the shop, and I don't know how much longer it's going to be in the shop, so I'm having to bum rides off everybody. And that's a little frustration, you know. But if I don't, if I'm sinning, in that frustration and getting angry or frustrated, a woman who is a walking in the light will say, Lord, that's wrong. I know that's wrong. You've ordained this. You've ordained my day. You've ordained that interruption. Would you please forgive me and help me to respond better the next time? That's what John is saying. You confess your sin. Or, Lord, I'm jealous over a certain a lady in my church, or I'm jealous over this or that. Lord, I know love is not jealous. Love doesn't envy. Please forgive me. Or I got angry at my child this morning. He spilled his milk before I came to, to Bible study. Why couldn't he spill his milk after Bible study? He spilled it before Bible study. And I got angry. Lord, I know that's wrong. Would you please forgive me? And would you help me the next time my child spills his milk on, in an accident to not be angry? Ladies, a woman who's walking in the light will be conscious of those things. That's the Holy Spirit living within you that says that wasn't right. She won't excuse her sin. She admits it. She confesses it. And she endeavors to forsake it. In fact, the tense here in the Greek, to confess, is in the present tense in the Greek, which means we keep on confessing our sin. Because, ladies, tomorrow morning you're going you're gonna to have more sin tomorrow. Aren't you excited about that? <laughs> no, it's not very exciting. That's what makes heaven so great, right? Uh, my husband's been in a perfected state for eight months. Can't believe it. I mean, with no sin. Can't wait to meet him without sin. That'll be great. I'm sure he can't wait to meet me without sin, too. But uh, we confess it, and we forsake it, and we keep on doing it. 
Ladies, a genuine believer in Christ who's walking in the light is in the habit of confessing their sin. It's like the psalmist says, I acknowledge my sin and my transgression is ever before you, against you, and you only have I sinned. Now, perhaps we should define what sin is since John mentions it so much in this text. Sin is actually lawlessness or transgression of God's will, either by omitting to do what his law requires or by doing what he forbids. For example, I'll give you an example of this. We're going to see this in 1 John. John tells us over and over in 1 John that we are to love the brethren. Do you know that's something the law required? Leviticus 19, 18 says, you shall not hate your brother in heart, you shall love your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? So that's something that the law requires of us. We are to love each other. But John will also tell us in 1 John, we are not to hate our brother, which means to detest him. And if we do, uh, we're a murderer, he says. That's something the law forbids. The law forbids that we should hate each other. In fact, Leviticus 19 says don't hate each other, but rather rebuke each other. Don't allow sin upon each other. So that's a sin, something the law forbids or something the law tells us to do. And the transgression here, sin, ladies, can occur in three ways. The things we do. Like what you're, you know, what you're going to do after class today. I mean, it could be sinful. It could not be sinful. So it's things we might do. It also might be things that come out of our mouth, right? Um, I don't know what words you've said today. We speak 18,000 words a day, so uh, maybe we should just put duct tape on our mouth for the rest of the day. But even the things we say with our mouth, we're going to give an account for everything we've done in our body, good or bad, right? We're going to be accountable for our mouth. By our words, we'll be justified. By our words, we'll be condemned. So sinning can take place in the mouth. But you know where it takes place the most? Right here. Jeremiah talks about the fruit of our thoughts. So, you know, a lot of times I'm not sinning with my, my hands or my feet or things I do, or I'm not sinning with my mouth, but it's right here that God sees. And so when we think about sin, we have to think about all three of those areas. And the mind is which nobody sees but you and the Lord. And so the sin here that John is mentioning is a definite act of sin. It's to say, I'm confessing this specific sin. And notice what he says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. So who is the confessing to? Who's the one that's faithful to forgive? It's okay. You can talk. There's no men in here. He, it's Christ. Christ is faithful to cleanse us, forgive us from all unrighteousness. Now, I will say this. We do confess our sins to the Lord. But if I've sinned against you, I need to confess my sins to you. If I've lied to you, I need to come and say, hey, you know, what I told you the other day, that wasn't true. Or if I've gotten frustrated with you or something that is wrong, I am to confess to you. We're to confess our faults to one another, pray for one another so you can be healed. In fact, Jesus will even say on the Sermon on the Mount, if you come to church on Sunday morning or even Tuesday morning or whenever you come and, and you come to you know worship, but you know that you have something against somebody, a brother or sister, he says, go up, get out of here, basically. <laughs> go your way, make that right, and then come and worship. And so, ladies, we're to, we're to confess to one another uh, when we have done something or we've sinned against one another. But here John is talking about confessing our sins to him. And notice the first benefit of confessing our sins. Isn't it interesting that just as there are two consequences of saying we have no sin, there are two consequences of those who admit their sin and confess it. Notice what he says. The first result is that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean he's faithful to forgive? He's faithful to his covenant he made with you when you bowed your knee to his lordship. He's faithful to forgive. Remember, we brought out last week, as far as the east is from the west, he has forgiven our transgressions. Ladies, if you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I've sinned against you, please forgive me. You know what? You can bank on it. He's dependable. He's going to forgive you. He's faithful. And he's not only faithful, but John says he's just, which means God can't overlook our sin. Ladies, God doesn't let you get by with your sin. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> he is just. 
He is just in the sense if you don't confess your sins to him, he will hold you accountable, and many times you bear the consequences of those sins. Hebrews talks about the fact whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he scourges every son whom he receives. And if the Lord doesn't chasten you, then you're not a son. You're not a son. Uh, Hebrews says you're illegitimate. You're not his son. And I know you've been there. I've been there too. Don't look so pious. Where uh, you've remained in sin for a while and not made it right with the Lord. And you know what happens. You're miserable. First of all, that's a consequence right there, right? But then also sometimes the Lord does discipline us. And I remember years ago, right, I'd been only a Christian three or four years. And, and uh, you know, you're, you're in that process of sanctification, which we still all are. And I remember a specific sin I committed and the specific spanking I got from the Lord was almost humorous because it was, it was perfect for what I'd done, a perfect punishment for the sin. And so, but I'm thankful whom the Lord loves, he chastens, right? So he brings us back as a good shepherd does uh, with that staff and rod he brings us back he's also just in the sense it would be wrong it would be unjust if he withheld his forgiveness of our sins right so you confess your sins to the lord and he goes eh, i'm not forgiving you that's not our god he's just he's just he does what is right and so he says i will forgive you and ladies his faithfulness and his justice are not dependent on our confession but what John is saying, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us. What does it mean to forgive? It means he sends them away. He cancels the debt. Debt paid. Move on. Ladies, that's why it's very harmful when you're very um, self-introverted in and always examining and beating yourself up over your sin. I remember one time I was reading the life and diary of David Brainerd and a great read, but Doug said, Susan, be careful. Be careful about reading his material. Great guy, but he beat himself up all day about what he didn't do for the Lord and how awful and wicked he was and all that. Some of that is good, but we can become so introspective about our sin that Satan uses, a, uses that to keep us from moving on in our Christian life. And ladies, take this verse at face value. He's faithful. He's just to forgive you. Now move on. You've confessed it, right? And move on with your life and serving him. He sends it away. He dismisses the charges. In fact, it often refers to releasing a person from a legal obligation like a debt. The second benefit of confessing your sins, he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Ladies, notice it's all unrighteousness. It's all sin. There is not one sin that you can commit that God will not forgive, except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And if you're a genuine Christian, you haven't committed that sin. So isn't that good? So ladies, there's no sin that you can commit that God will not forgive forgive. The cleansing here means to make holy or purify. And this cleansing is applied, applied, excuse me, by the blood of Jesus Christ, as we saw in verse seven. So maybe you're asking the question, Susan, if we're cleansed from all of our sin, then why do we keep on sinning? If we're saved from sin, why do we keep on sinning after we become a Christian? Ladies, we're saved from the power and the influence of sin. Sin should no longer master your life. Sin no longer is master. In fact, Paul says in Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we're no longer slaves to sin. Ladies, we've been freed from that. We're not a slave of sin. We're a slave of righteousness. Do we sin? Yes, we sin. We still have some of the old man in us, unfortunately. And that's what makes heaven so glorious. We are not going to sin. Well, what is the proper attitude towards sin if you're taking notes? We admit it and we confess it. Well, John now goes back to mention those who will continue to say they have not sinned in verse 10, and he adds two more consequences of that improper attitude. Notice what he says. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Here we go again with these false teachers and those who follow them. <laughs> this time they're saying, they're claiming that they do not commit single acts of sin. Before they're saying, I deny I even have a sin nature. I don't even have a sin nature. Now they're saying, 
I don't commit single acts of sin. I never commit any type of sin. Now, I will tell you, ladies, I have met people like this, and they're difficult to be around, right? Have you ever met people like that? I don't sin. No? Well, I have. I was like, I want to meet your spouse and ask him what he would say. Um, ladies, we do sin. We sin every day. Many of us are good about justifying it or blaming someone else for our sin, right? If only, you know, if only it wasn't that time of the month. My husband used to say, pray before that time of the month, you know. And then I learned to not only pray, but keep my mouth shut before that time of the month. Thankfully, I don't have that time of the month anymore. But anyway, we justify, right? If it's time of the month, or I have a headache, or I have an earache, or, you know, you don't understand. I was lonely. I was, I was hungry. I was fearful. I was, you know, these are the things that caused me to sin. We're still doing what John's saying. We're claiming, you know, I, I didn't sin. It, it, was, it was her fault. It was, his, you know, it was his fault, the woman you gave me. And, you know, it was the serpent's fault. He beguiled me, and that's why I did. It was, you know, everybody's fault but my own fault. Ladies, we're still not coming clean with ourselves or with God and admitting, I did it. I did it. Maybe I was hungry. Maybe I was tired. Maybe I, you know, I, I used to learn when I was married that, you know, not to get into any deep conversations with Doug when I was tired. It was time to go to bed. I thought, everything will look different in the morning, right? So just go to bed and you'll sin less. Just go to bed, go to sleep. And when you're hungry, you know, just keep your mouth shut until you can get some food. But, uh, in fact, someone used to tell me Satan attacks us H-A-L-T when we're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And so when you're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. Watch your thoughts, too, because you're accountable for that. But we can't justify our sin. We have to admit it. So if I say I've never committed an act of sin, what does it say about me? Well, notice what John says. We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, what does it mean we make God a liar? How can we make God a liar when God doesn't lie? How do we do that? What John is saying here, you're accusing God of being a liar. Now, ladies, put your thinking caps on. Think with me. God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? God says there's not a just man upon earth that does good and does not sin. God says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, right? There's none that does righteous. No, not one. So if I say, I haven't sinned, <laughs> I haven't sinned, I deny the principle of sin, so I what? I make God a liar. God, you said all of sin, but I don't sin. <laughs> you got me wrong. You got, you're wrong here, God. I, I don't sin. But God says all have sinned, right? So I'm making God a liar. And ladies, that's a serious accusation, right? To call God a liar? That's a serious accusation against a holy God. God does not lie. So if we had no sin, there's no need for a Savior, right? There's no need for an atoning sacrifice, as John will say in chapter 2, verse 2 in just a minute. The second thing he says about those who claim they have no sin, he said the word is not in them. Now John said in verse 8, the truth is not in us, and now he says the word is not in us. What's the difference? The truth is what? It's the embodied person of Christ. He is the way, the truth, the Holy Spirit, the Son of God. He, Christ is in us, the hope of glory. But now he's saying the word is not in you. What's he saying? Think very carefully. Remember the promise of the new covenant? I will put my spirit within you. That's the truth. I will what? Write my law in your heart. His word, you're saying God's in you. He's not. And neither is his word. His word is not in you either. The law has not been written on your heart. That's the promise of the new covenant. And he causes us to walk in his ways. He helps us to live a life of sanctification. So if I say... I don't commit any acts of sin. Not only is Christ not in me, the truth isn't in me, but neither is his word. His law is not written in my heart. Ladies, you can't say that you're walking in the light and say you have no sin. Well, John continues on with a proper attitude towards sin in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. And ladies, this is one of those things, you know, remember when we opened up last week, John is really, 1 John is really a sermon. It's not an epistle, it's really a sermon. It was preached at one time, it was given at one time. Translators come in, they add chapters and verses. 
This was not in the original when John wrote 1 John. It was just a letter. And so this is one of those very, very unfortunate chapter divisions. And so uh, we need to go right into chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. John goes on to write again with one of his purpose for writing the epistle of John. And he's continuing his thoughts about sin. And notice what he says. My little children, these things write unto you that you do not sin. Now, notice the affection here, little children. In fact, I wish we had time to read all of 1 John. We don't. But um, to look at all the times that John calls them little children. My little children, I love you. Little born ones. And he gives another purpose for writing this letter. We saw last week he wrote the purpose, these things I write unto you, that your joy might be full. And now he's writing again. He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you do not sin. What is he saying here? He knows they're going to sin. What is he saying? I'm writing these things to you so that you will avoid sin, refuse sin, run from sin. I don't want you to sin. Ladies, Paul felt the same way about the church at Corinth. Remember the church at Corinth? There was a man that was having a relationship with his father's wife. There was incest going on. There was jealousy. There was strife. There was backbiting. There was all kinds of things. And John said, you know, I don't, or Paul said, I don't want you to sin. <laughs> Examine yourselves. I'm, sure, I'm not sure you guys are even in the faith. I don't want you all to sin. Um, I know, you know, as a, as a pastor's wife of 46 years and watching my husband and us, you know, shepherding churches for years, and we didn't want our people to sin. Uh, women I pour my life into today even, uh, I don't want them to sin. I don't want myself to sin. I hate it when I sin, you know. But it's that, that desire you have for those that you shepherd, those you pour your life into. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you do not sin. That was John's desire for the church there at Ephesus. And ladies, that should be the desire for all of us. Um, we shouldn't see how close we can, you know, get by with things and how much sin can I get, what, get away with. We should want to avoid it, refuse it. In fact, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that we're to strive for perfection, be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. Peter says, be holy as I am holy. Uh, John will talk about the Lord's return in 1 John chapter 3 when talking about when he comes and because of his coming, uh, we're going to see him as he is. And he, he says, therefore, purify yourself as he's pure. And so John wanted these people to live a life of holiness. And so, ladies, this is another attitude, proper attitude, for those who walk in the light. They hate sin. They hate it. They avoid it. They run from it. They do like Joseph did when he was, to, you know, I don't know the word, uh, yeah, I can't even think of the word now. But anyway, you know, propositioned, I guess, by Potiphar's wife every day. And he finally had enough sense, and he ran and got out. He took his coat and got out. And, of course, he went to prison for it. But we should avoid it. We should hate it. We should run from it. We should be like Paul. The good that I want to do, I, I hate. The evil that I, I, I want to do, that's what I end up doing. Why do I end up doing what I hate? <laughs> and he says, oh, wretched man, who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, John doesn't want them to sin, and yet he realizes they will sin. He knows that perfection is not going to happen till glory, and so he says this. But if you do sin, notice, if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Ladies, even though the goal for each one of us in this room should be not to sin, you are going to sin. You're going to sin, unless you're claiming to be Gnostic, <laughs> that you have no sin. You are going to sin, but when you do sin... You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We don't have to confess to a priest. Isn't that great? We can go straight to our advocate. Now, what's an advocate? Well, an advocate is someone who's an intercessor or a consoler. In fact, it's someone who is called to your side as a helper. In fact, in the legal world, it would be someone that would be called aside as a testimony or a witness. It's not the attorney but a friend who's called to testify to your character, and they plead your cause on your behalf. Do you know Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father? He's an advocate for you. He's pleading on your behalf. Every time you sin, Father, I died for that sin. You sin, then, Father, I died for that sin. The devil's the accuser of the brethren. Jesus is our advocate. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Father, I died for that sin. 
Christ is our friend, so to speak, and he intercedes and helps us before the judge, the Father. One man said, Jay Adams, I love this, God has provided a lawyer to plead your case in court. This is no ordinary lawyer. He's never lost a case. So there you go. So every time he pleads on your behalf, the Father says, okay, okay. I know Susan sinned, but you're right. Uh, you died for that sin. It, it pleased me to bruise you on the cross. You're right. You died for that sin. She's clean. Ladies, I say we have an advocate. So when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Ladies, this should encourage you. It tells me my Lord not only loved me so much that he came to earth to die for me, but he continues to show his love for me by interceding for me on my behalf when I do sin. Now, why does John say he's with the Father? Because he's sitting at his right hand, right? And the Father and the Son are what? They're one. They're one. He's face to face with the Father. Jesus says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Why does John call him Jesus Christ the righteous? Interesting, in the Greek there's no article. Just like last week we saw Jesus, light. Not Jesus is the light. Here it's the same thing, no article. Jesus Christ righteous. That's how it literally reads in the Greek. He is righteous. Jesus doesn't use tricks to get his client off. There's no plea bargaining. He admits the guilt. He pleads on our behalf because he himself has paid the penalty for our sin. Ladies, the death's been paid. He has the wounds to prove it, right? In his hands, in his feet, in his side. Here's the wounds to prove my love for those that I died for. Jesus Christ being righteous is the only one who can cleanse us from all unrighteousness as mentioned in 1 John 1, 9. Well, Jesus Christ is not only our advocate, but John tells us another wonderful truth about our Savior in verse 2. Notice what he says. He himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, what does it mean he's the propitiation for our sins? He himself alone is the atonement for our sins. In fact, the word for propitiation was used uh, in the Greek world to uh, indicate the sacrifice that they would do to appease the wrath of an angry God. What's John saying? Well, we know from Scripture God is angry with the wicked every day, right? God hates sin. He's justifiably angry every day, but... His son, Jesus Christ, being the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation, made it possible to appease the wrath of God upon man's sin. He's the propitiation for our sin. Ladies, we do sin. We do sin, and we are in need of someone to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And who is that person? <laughs> Jesus Christ, righteous. Jesus Christ, righteous. Not only is a propitiation for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And you might say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Is John a universalist? Does John believe everyone's going to be saved? I mean, he's really lost it here. Is he Gnostic? What's wrong with him? No, he's not a universalist. There's two thoughts on this. The first thought is John is, remember, writing to a Jewish audience. And so he could be referring to the fact he died for the sins of the whole world, including the Gentile nation. We know from Romans 11, the Jews what? They rejected Christ. He came into his own, his own didn't receive him. And so what? If you know anything about Romans 11, the Gentiles are grafted into that olive tree. So salvation is offered to what? Jew, Greek, male, female, circumcision, uncircumcised. It's offered to all, all kinds of different people. That could be one view on that. However, I kind of believe it's that God did love the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He did die for the sins of the world. He loved the world. He died for the world. But only those who believe and repent of their sins have the wonderful blessing of having their sins atoned for. He is the propitiation for our sin. Isaiah says he died not for the sins of all, but for the sins of many, for those he called. And so um, there's two different thoughts on that. Well, how can we continue to live in sin when Jesus Christ, the righteous, has sacrificed so much to atone for our sins? Doesn't make sense, does it? Ladies, I, I hope this lesson encourages you. Don't be afraid to confess your sin to the Lord. Do it right away so that fellowship can be restored. Don't, don't go around in your sin all day and 
bask in it for two or three days. It's miserable. <laughs> Confess it. He's, he's there pleading on your behalf and get on with your life, right? And don't be morbid about it. Always, you know, beating yourself up over your sin. Confess it and move on. So what is a wrong attitude towards sin? To make some denial of the fact we have a sin nature and to deny personal acts of sin. What is the right attitude towards sin? Admit it, confess it, hate it, run from it, avoid it. What is your attitude towards sin? Do you deny sin as a part of your nature? Do you deny you have specific acts of sin? Do you say, I have no sin? Do you justify it, minimize it? Do you call your sin a mistake? Then, my friend, you've deceived yourself. The truth is not in you. You've made God a liar, and his word isn't in you. On the other hand, do you run from sin? Do you avoid it? Do you hate it? Do you confess your sins? If so, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins, to cleanse you, to plead to the Father on your behalf. What great promises for those who are walking in the light. Now, maybe you are walking in the light. I hope each one of you are, but you're struggling with sin. In closing, I want to give you three suggestions, suggestions that I have found very helpful in my Christian walk, and they're in the acrostic sin. Uh, if you want a larger um, teaching on this, you can get my book on putting off life-dominating sins, but these are three that I think are very helpful in the acrostic sin. The first one is satur saturate your mind with the Word of God. My husband left a great legacy of reading his Bible through almost three times a month. Um, do you know, I was reading something the other day about the Puritans. Those are the ones that lived in the 1800s. Do you know they made it their habit to read 50 chapters a day out of the Bible? Now, we think a chapter a day keeps the devil away. That just invites the devil. That's what Doug used to say. One chapter a day just invites him. Ladies, we should be reading from Genesis to Revelation massive amounts of scripture. What does the Bible say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against God. So we don't want to just read it. We want to study it. We want to memorize it. We want God's word to saturate our minds and our hearts. That's how we're going to even be aware of what sin is. Huh? I mean, I'm surprised how many women don't even know what sin is. And I'll say, well, you realize the Bible speaks against that. Oh, it does? Yeah, well, let's turn. You know, it does say you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> or you're supposed to be doing this. Secondly, the I, be involved in others' lives, involvement in others' lives. You know what the Bible says? One, but one thing that has concerned me about COVID, a man who isolates himself brings himself to destruction. We're seeing so much depression, anxiety, worry, suicide, because we've been isolated from each other for two years. Ladies, we need each other. Do you know how many times the Bible talks about our need to be involved in each other's lives? I don't have time to go through all these, but listen to these. Love one another, exhort one another, consider each other, edify each other, comfort each other, admonish each other, forgive each other, forbear with each other, serve each other, prefer each other. <laughs> if you were doing all those things, you wouldn't have time to sin, would you? We wouldn't have so much time on our hands if we would be involved in each other's lives. Why do we waste so much time on trivial pursuits? Ladies, if you would be involved in the one another's involvement in each other's lives, you wouldn't be idle with your time. So many women get so caught up in social media that's just trivial drippings. You know, it's, it's a waste of time. A lot of that is a waste of time, just scrolling through. I was sitting on the plane yesterday coming home from Houston, and the gal that was sitting at the window seat just the whole time, you know, she's checking her in the whole time, you know, two hours, Instagram, Instagram. I'm like, what a, what a waste of time. I don't know if she's a believer or not, but, you know, they put their earbuds in now. You can't even talk to him, but, but you know, it's what a waste of time. Those two hours could be used, what, reading or uh, talking to someone, ministering to someone, taking a meal to someone, visiting a, sh visiting a shut-in, uh, uh, someone that can't get out. You know, there's so many things. Give me a ride if I need one because I don't have a car. I mean, all these one another's. Uh, discipleship, be involved in discipling others and people discipling you. Be involved. And lastly is the end. Need for intercessory prayer. Ladies, this will help you. Um, what did Jesus say? Watch, watch and pray so you enter not into temptation. Ladies, you know, when we get to Ephesians this fall, Lord willing, we get to chapter 6, Lord willing, if the Lord hasn't come. Um, one of the things he said when he talks about fighting the devil and fighting sin, after he gives the, all the armor, you know what he says right there in chapter 6, verse 18? 
pray always. You know, the Bible says don't be anxious for anything, but what? Pray. And so when you're tempted, pray, Lord. Uh, I know since Doug's been past uh, now eight months, I have more struggle now in my mind than I've ever had before. But you know what? I'm praying. Lord, help me. Remove that thought. I'm asking others to pray for me. Uh, we don't have because we don't ask. And so, ladies, if you want to really fight against sin, you need to saturate your mind with God's word. You need to pray, and you need to be involved in people's lives. May we all have the attitude of the evangelist Billy Sunday who once said about sin, I love this, I'm against sin, I'm going to kick it as long as I've got a foot, and I'm going to fight it as long as I've got a fist. I'm going to butt it as long as I've got a head. I'm going to bite it as long as I've got a tooth. When I'm old and fistless and fo footless and toothless, I'm going to gum it till I go to glory. <laughs> and it goes home to perdition. So let's pray together. Oh, Father, I know that um, this is a, a sobering lesson, but, Lord, we do want to help each other in our fight against sin. Lord, we want to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, so that the world will look at us and realize that we have the word in us. We have the truth in us, and we want to be a testimony to the gospel. Help us to fight that sin in our members. Help us to not be satisfied with where we are in our Christian walk. Uh, help us to not justify our sin or blame it on someone else, but to confess it and know that you will forgive us. Oh, fathers, thank you for forgiving us, cleansing us from all of our sin. Thank you for Jesus Christ, righteous. In his name I pray. Amen. <laughs>